Good evening. Thank you for joining our Hamilton Reads 2021 panel on environmental poetry. This is the third of four online conversations around the themes in Blaze Island by Catherine Bush. Information about the finale event is posted in the chat. Please use the same chat box to ask questions to the poets. Today we are joined by environmental poets Claire Caldwell, Kim Goldberg, Ross Ballot, moderated by Jacqueline DeForge. Kiyama Claire said of Blaze Island, riveting and morally complex, Blaze Island is a beautiful kaleidoscopic work that offers a resounding reply to the question of how literature might wrestle with the deepest threat facing the planet, anthropogenic climate change. Each poet here today writes about climate change and environmentalism with the same conviction. My name is Nancy and I'm tremendously pleased to host this conversation about words and the world. I will take a moment to acknowledge that the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Here Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can do better to understand our roles as residents, neighbours, partners and caretakers. I'm pleased to welcome our authors and encourage you to find their publications at local independent bookstores like Epic Books at their Locke and Sherman Avenue locations, King West Books in Westdale, The City and the City on Ottawa Street, and all retailers that support books and literacy. Claire Caldwell is the author of Gold Rush, Invisible Publishing 2020, and Invasive Species, Woolsack and Wind 2014. Claire was a 2016 writer in residence at the Burton House in Dawson City, Yukon, and she holds an MFA from the University of Guelph. She lives in Toronto, where she also edits children's books at Anik Press. Kim Goldberg is the author of eight books of poetry and nonfiction. Her latest book is Devolution, Caitlin Press 2020, Surreal Poems and Fables of Eco-Apocalypse. It was described as a ferocious collection in the Vancouver Sun, and Kim terms it her personal act of extinction rebellion. Her poetry mm -hmm. has appeared in literary magazines and anthologies in North America and abroad, including the Capilano Review, Literary Review of Canada, Dark Mountain, Subterrain, and Watch Your Head. She chaired the Women's Eco -pa Poetry Panel at the inaugural Cascadia Poetry Festival in Seattle. Kim holds a degree in biology and is an avid bird watcher in Nanaimo, BC. Ross Ballot lives in Hamilton most of the time, where he does poetry, photography, filmmaking, and has been writing opinion pieces on energy and climate change policy for the Nat National Observer and iPolitics. He worked for decades in the oil industry, but took early retirement in 2014 to make films and study eco-poetics at the MFA program at St. Mary's College of California with Brenda Hillman and Matthew Zapratter, graduating in 2017. His recent collection from Hamilton's own Woolsack and Wynn was on the CBC's list of best poetry books in Canada for 2020. He received a Canada Council for the Arts grant in 2020 to produce videos of poems from that collection, one of which was shown at last year's Hamilton Film Festival, and another was selected for the International Video Poetry Festival in Athens, Greece last June. His poems have found their way into Best Canadian Poetry in English 2013, the 2018 CBC Poetry Prize long list, and the finalist for the 2016 CBC Poetry Prize. He's performed readings of his work widely, widely including for the National Arts Centre and as a signature event for this year's Hamilton Arts Week. Jacqueline DeForge is the author of a poetry collection, Danger Flower, Palimpsest Press and Anstruther Books 2021, and a picture book, Why Are You So Quiet? from Anik Press 2020. Jacqueline is a Pushcart nominated writer and the winner of the 2018 RBC Pen Canada New Voices Award, two 2019 Short Works Prizes, and a 2020 Hamilton Emerging Artist Award for Writing. 
Jacqueline's writing has been featured in literary magazines across Canada. She is an MFA candidate at the University of British Columbia School of Creative Writing and lives in Hamilton with her partner and daughter. I'll pass things over to Jacqueline, who will begin the conversation. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you so much, Nancy, and thank you everyone for coming. I'm so delighted to be here with these wonderful poets. Um, these are absolutely fantastic books that I, I really encourage you to pick up. I enjoyed reading them so much. Um, we're going to start with some short readings by the poets. Uh, first, I'm going to read each of their book descriptions, and then we'll get into a discussion about environmental poetry and climate change. Um, really, really delighted to talk to you all. Um, so our first poet who's going to be reading to us is Claire, and I'm just going to read the description of your book. From the Klondike to an all-girls summer camp to the frontier of outer space, Gold Rush explores what it means to be a settler woman in the wilderness, drawing on and subverting portrayals of nature from Susanna Moody to Cheryl Strayed. Cal Caldwell's poems examine the tension between the violence and empowerment women have often sought and found in wild places. This is the violence young girls inflict on each other, colonial violence perpetrated by white settler women, violence against nature itself. Many of these poems portray a climate in crisis, suggesting that even wilderness, wilderness buffs are complicit in climate change. Whether they're trekking to the Chilkut Trail, exploring the frontiers of their own bodies and desires, or navigating an unstable, unfamiliar climate, the girls and women in these poems are pioneers in all the complexities contained in the term. Thank you, Claire. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. Thanks, um, Hamilton Public Library. Thanks, Nancy, and thanks to the other poets. Um, yeah, super happy to be here, and I'm just going to read three poems from the collection. Backcountry Almanac. Our guide is a goddess in quick dry shorts, braid that could save you from drowning. Says, weather's just a function of how many swims you take. A leech in the pannikin is worth her laughter. The value of blisters is praise. We slough sunscreen, export freckles, import spit and bug spray. The portage ends when we hit the lake, but meanwhile she's mythic. Boreal centaur all hull and hiking boots, mud spattered legs. Guardian of time and trail mix, 19 but seems immortal. And yes, she says, if a girl falls in a forest, she leaves a trace. And this next one's a little bit of a shift in tone, but hopefully it'll give you a little taste of um, the range of the collection. This one is called Homestead Rescue, which is also the title of a reality TV show. <laughs> give me your cracked foundations, your chainsaw accidents, your decapitated hens. Give me carbon monoxide poisoning, water tank contaminated by a family of leering possums. I'm the patron saint of failing homesteads, and I've come with my camera crew. I've brought my son, a felled larch hewn into muscle. My daughter cut from a lynx's womb. She'll rip apart your sibling rivalry to make space for a meat smoker. He'll strip the tree limbs throwing tantrums on your roof firewood or fourth wall for your outhouse. We'll prep you to survive the winter, but only if you shriek before commercial breaks. You own everything between bedrock and sharp shinned hawk, and you're still hungry? That's embarrassing. Show me your palest offspring. I'll fill him with buckshot lust, force him to field dress a doe. The more he cries, the higher the ratings, but don't worry, I'll pull the trigger. This is TV. We need to kill something. And this is the last one I'll read. It's called After the Gold Rush. The dry century retreated, left mustangs bucking across brothel walls. The sky coughed up its molars, mushrooms bruised every lawn. Spruce got wasted on spongy permafrost while cabins kissed sloppily. 
jaws and antlers surged through sprays of reindeer moss like breaching whales. Night returned earlier than expected, hitched a ride from Whitehorse with a cloud who chugged the Bering Sea. Beavers redeveloped tailing ponds with moats of squirrel grass, raspberries. We bleached the forest with headlamps, sauteed milk caps, lashed chives to our backs like arrows. Sometimes rain was just weather, the flare of fangs in the willows, an injured dog. The ice bridge atrophied to a catwalk. The only snow, a defiant strain of strep throat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claire. Wow, it's so great to hear you read those out loud. OK, our next reading by Kim. Uh, Devolution is Kim Goldberg's eighth book and her personal act of extinction rebellion. The poems and fables span the Anthropocene, speaking to ecological unraveling, social confusion, private pilgrimage, urbanization, and wildness. Using absurdism, surrealism, and satire, Goldberg offers up businessmen who loft away as crows, a town that reshapes itself every night, each night, a journey through caves so narrow we must become centipedes to pass. Goldberg's canvas holds both the personal and the political at once, offering rich layers of meaning, but with a playfulness reminiscent of Calvino or Borges. Each imaginative narrative will haunt the reader long after the book has been put down. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I'm just going to share three short poems from the book. Uh, the first is Atlantis. In the lost city of Atlantis, we drift from God to God. The animals on display have slipped their feathered cages and gilt chains. The big top sits empty, not even a flea in the matchbox seats. It was tricky at first, a skid through marbles on the curve. The swifts departed in ash plumes rising from the lacerated rim of our existence. They took the night with them. We now know through inductive reasoning and computer simulations that the Swifts were the night, and with night comes sleep, and with sleep, dreams. You see where this narrative of privation is leading. Wait, there, behind the goat-shaped cloud, I think I see another god. And this next poem is Somewhere a Creature. It's a sonnet that I wrote for Nanaimo's Discontent City, which was a very large and long-standing tent city in downtown Nanaimo that housed more than 400 homeless people at its peak and was more than once the target of right-wing hate group soldiers of Odin. Somewhere a Creature. Upon the planet's stony hide, unloved, or sandstorms scour bones to piles of chalk. A kaleidoscopic rash of domes erupts. Passers-by swivel, rumble, gawk. Each hemisphere a mystery inside. Bauble, beast, arcane chemistry. To look would alter flow of sun and tide. The world's a wobble with uncertainty. Beside one dome, a garden grows abundant. Beside another, knives do claim some flesh. There's talk of secret springs, an end to hunger. Somewhere, a creature slips its master's leash. Once the drift toward meaning has begun, it is a thing can never be undone. And my last poem is Shortly Before the End. Shortly before the end, their minds turned sleek and black and were last seen bobbing and diving among the small open fish boats in the harbor. The golden light scattered diamonds atop the sea whenever a lean mine broke the surface. Each mind had a tight band around its neck and a string on one leg. This allowed it to continue searching 
and biting down on anything slippery it might encounter while scouring the murky depths. But the collar prevented the mind from assimilating its catch, thus rendering each mind into an immaculate, self-propelled satchel that was relieved of its still squirming bounty by a higher power every time it bobbed to the surface and the string was reeled in. By afternoon, the collars were removed and the ravenous minds were allowed to eat just enough of their catch to remain conscious and nourish brain cells. Then they were shut away in a wicker crate until the following day. Thanks Thank so you. Thank you so much, Kim. That was beautiful. The next reading from Ross, moving to climate change hours. From industrial accidents to frozen highways, the lot charts what faces a working man in stripped down lyric poetry. Moving to climate change hours is a solemn ode to the end of oil filled with poems that have seen it all and can acknowledge the darkness that's coming while still finding beauty in the arched neck of a tundra swan. With a filmmaker's sense of atmosphere and an environmentalist urgency, Balot's stark lines take the reader deep into the heart of the industrial man. Pass it to Ross. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the Hamilton Library and also Jacqueline for that introduction. Um, I'm going to read three poems as well. First one's the first poem in the book, First Day. Gulf Oil Refinery, Clarkson, Ontario, 1979. Two men blinded by hydrofluoric acid yesterday. The skin of one absorbed acid and it ate his bones. He died this morning. The gate safety sign says 12 hours worked since the last lost time. The safety trainer lectures, hydrogen sulfide. At high concentrations, it causes olfactory paralysis. You can't smell it. Then you fall down unconscious and next you die. If you see a body on the ground, you must check wind direction, move up wind, call for help. Imagine your best friend Bill on the ground, how it would feel to leave him. This is your first day. Wear work boots, learn work rules, get the paycheck, go home to Shelley, pregnant with Neil, looking after little Heather. Do the right thing, be a good boy. Come home safe 10,000 more times. Lac Megantic. Observe, slim moon, usual July stars, clean night breeze. They put railway tracks right down the middle of this small town street, as if inviting the multitude to descend. A bar in the center of town called Musique Cafe. A band takes a break around then, a guitarist outside smoking. A couple at a table on the patio. They are 40-ish and met here tonight by accident. A friend leaves at 1 a.m. for her car, wakes at them. Rotting fruit smell of oil. What emerges from feeding our addiction? 20 million pounds of steel and Bach and crude oil on fire. 47 people killed, five of them vaporized. The local hospital said no injuries got treated. They were all dead already. The young firefighter pulled his ex-girlfriend from wreckage, committed suicide three and a half months later. Receive back your names. Enumerate your ages. You, how you left Musique Cafe, left your friends, your brothers, how you were singing. You tell us how you prayed every matin at 4 a.m. Your benedictions asked for, received, you, your little sister slept under the sky's black curve, your souls to keep. Stars once reflecting, waters once unoiled, lake of places where the fishes are held. And the last poem I'll read um, is where the title of the book comes from. Today we move to climate change hours. We left town for the cabin, deserved the break from full on working, full on drinkable lives. 
fumes collecting and rising on their own specified terms. Nickelback on the radio and IHateLimes.com on the iPad. Yearning for the old knocking engine, what we used to call ping. The car drove the Sierras. NPR told us of COP21 fixing the line of climate change more. Board pulls to sing off the crowds while we sang off our hearts, only we had tire chains and change for the jukebox. Damage was done or would be at the appropriate time as agreed to by all the parties per memorandum of understanding, assignable but non-binding. Beyond the car door and off ramp, cars filling a void, fully odd us, requiring attention to literary, to emotional, to frequently held space, long slow turn, the steep grade check, your brakes, they say running out of road the problem, we never have reality from our political friends smiling away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ross. Thank you, everybody. Those were absolutely wonderful readings. I, it's such a delight to hear these poems and your voices after after reading them in my head. It's so much nicer to hear your voices. Um, so let's just let's jump into the discussion. There's so much to talk about here. Um, first off, I would really like to know what the seed of your collection was from each of you. What was it that began? Uh, the creation of your book. Would anyone like to go first? Just jump in. It's it's fine. We're all friends. OK, I, I'll say something. I think for me, I was working on my book Devolution for those poems for about 10 years. But in 2018, Extinction Rebellion launched. And that phrase, not only what Extinction Rebellion was, but just that phrase, that pair of words, Extinction Rebellion, it really gripped my mind and it was has been rattling around in my mind ever since. And so that actually had a lot to do with how the poems I was writing came together into one book. Mm. OK, anybody else? Um, I can go next. I so yeah, similar to Kim in the sense that I had been kind of writing poems. I've always um, written about nature and um, the outdoors and um, even urban nature, even climate change a little bit, but the the collection started to really feel like a collection or the poems started to really find their theme when I did the Burton House residency in the Yukon. Um, I think being so immersed in that just like spellbinding natural setting, um, meeting folks who had spent their whole lives there, reading um, accounts of people who had made their lives there over the years since you know the gold rush and and even before um and also returning so i had i had lived in the yukon as a child and returning to a place that had such a deep kind of like memory hold for me um all of that really started to give momentum to the collection and um brought a lot of the themes together for me thank you so much claire um, I would say for mine, um, I mean, most of the book was generated during the MFA at St. Mary's, as was mentioned. And I think the experience there, both being in California, though, you know, a place means a lot in terms of generating material for me. There's a lot from Banff, a lot from Vancouver and Hamilton, but also California. And I think the experience there kind of opened up my writing and I started exploring um, environmental themes uh, to an extent I hadn't before. Um, of course, you know, coming out of the industry I was in, that was always a concern. And um, I think uh, the work I was doing there allowed me to start writing things uh, in ways I hadn't before that was addressing that really urgent need to write material on the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the word urgency uh, really makes sense to me when it comes to talking about these collections. There's a sense of urgency in all of them and a sense of, of interaction with the world, uh, not escaping away, uh, but participating and, and looking at what's what's happening all around us. Um, and my like my second question is what what was it like to publish a collection on the subject of climate change in 2020, which is uh, a you know 
quite a year for a lot of reasons, including environmental ones. What was that experience like for you? Well, I'll, I'll say that the day my book was set to launch in March of 2020 at Nanaimo Harbor Front Library was the same day that the library and many, many other venues in Nanaimo and of course everywhere else closed as the start of our COVID restrictions because of COVID coming uh, to Canada as of March or earlier. And so it was so ironic and almost eerie and very much a case of uh, art imitating life, I would say, that the, the a book that was about climate change, ecological disaster, planetary collapse, the launch of it gets canceled due to a plague outbreak that closed everything down. It was just the whole experience was eerie. And I would say the whole first year, every, every one of us who's had a book come out, every author with a book in 2020 had a very unusual promotion experience with, with much reduced promotion, all festivals canceled, almost all reading venues closed. So it was, it was strange. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I think my publication date was like April 1st, 2020. So similarly, just yeah, right on the um, on that kind of first wave of things closing and and um, kind of having to adjust. And for me, I like I totally echo a lot of what you said, Kim. Um, and one of the weird things was like rereading some poems and not that they're they were like prescient in any way, but just like mm -hmm rereading them in light of what was going on felt very unsettling and they sort of took on a new meaning in this new environment for me and then negotiating what to actually read at those early readings because you know people were in a different mindset and um it was hard to decide like yeah do you do you um go for them the poems that are a little darker um a little eerier, the ones that do have this like new layer of meaning now that we're going through all of this. Um, so yeah, it was it was very strange to try to negotiate that. And um, yeah, despite the kind of the themes and, and what it, the collection talks about in terms of climate change, like it still felt odd to have that echoing effect. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, what, how about you, Ross? Well, uh, mine is also supposed to come out in the spring, but Noel um, pushed the publication into midsummer because, well, for one thing, her printer was shut down. Like the the firm that printed the book shut down as part of the, you know, that massive shutdown we had at the beginning. So it came out later, which I think was probably good. Um, but still, as has been mentioned, a lot of venues, well, there were no venues really to read in. I I think. Uh, which I miss, you know, a live audience talking. But, you know, I think it also opened up all these, um, you know, online readings became a thing. And, you know, the reach was pretty extraordinary um, in some cases, you know. And so friends of mine in California or say in England were able to actually watch, you know, my book launch. Mm. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting um, that, you know, this sort of global feeling, which I guess you know, we're seeing that with the COP right now, with everybody coming together trying to solve a problem. I, I think this, uh, you know, the World Wide Web kind of helps us um, work together on things. You know, it works the other way as well, obviously. So launching in the pandemic without the face-to-face, -face, but with sort of this virtual world, um, I think there were some real pluses to it, um, as well as the things we lost. Yeah, for, for sure. Absolutely true. Um, just sort of jumping off on what Claire was mentioning about, you know, what what poems do you choose in light of the new mood? Um, the poems in these collections are written about very serious topics, obviously, but they're also often very, very playful and funny and use wordplay. Um, my question is, is it ever tough to have a sense of humor in your writing when dealing with a topic as heavy as climate change? Yeah, it's really hard. You could see from the poems I read there, those first two, like there's no humor in them. Uh, they're they're too hard to do that. But there's other poems, the a little more playfulness in the last one. So, you know, you really, um, yes, you can still 
make fun of politicians who do nothing. Um, you know, point it out and satirize it a bit, I think. Um, and then, of course, there's other things we write about, about the environment where we still get to enjoy uh, the world. And I think that, you know, seeing the humor and playfulness there also is quite possible. Yeah, I would Claire. completely agree with that. Um, being able to, yeah, to approach um, the natural world and, you know, these experiences we can have in it with a little bit of sense of play, I think, helps us to be able to appreciate it um, or see it in a new way. At least that's my hope. And I think, I don't know, this past year, I've definitely been reflecting a lot on like, what is the role of um, poetry in this fight against climate change? And and what can a, what can a poem do? What can a poet do? And um, and I, I don't know where I've landed on that, but I, but I definitely think like being able to move between these different moods or tones or um, strategies or, um, uh, yeah, just these different ways of engaging with language and with our themes, I think, um, just helps readers hopefully, and I think my, for myself as a writer, just like helps me stay more attentive, I guess, and I think that's sort of the first place that we need to start is with that attention and noticing and um, being like really present in where we are and what's going on. So that's, I think that's what it's about for me. Thanks, Claire. Uh, Kim, do you have any thoughts on that one? Just, uh, I absurdism is sort of the core of the approach that I was taking. Although absurdism isn't necessarily humorous, it's not necessarily laugh out loud humorous. It can be it just, uh, it, it's, it can be a response to something that is so appalling that to front it straight on would be impossible, either for the writer or sometimes the reader. Often, or for me at least, uh, the way in can be this roundabout approach where one's dealing with fantastical fables that have an absurdist tone, a surreal tone. And so this creates an entry point. People become intrigued. I, I often find that with issues as heavy and overwhelming as the state of the collapsing environment, there can be a numbing effect on people when they hear the information over and over because they feel a sense of helplessness and impotence. And if you can find another way for the for people to engage with the same subject material, then all of a sudden their spirit rises and they're ready to take it on. So I, I think for me, that's what the absurdism and the fabulism is about. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And that, and that sort of ties in with my next question, which is about strangeness. And, and Kim, I, I just, I have to say that I, I love your book cover so much. There's nothing like a reverse mermaid. Um, I just, I just absolutely love it. Um, but all, all three of your books really do play with strangeness in language and imagery. Um, and and why do you think that sense of defamiliarization is so effective when when writing about climate change? Is it as Kim was just talking about a, a way of helping approach the subject a little bit off center so that people can perhaps emotionally handle it a little bit better to to be able to see what's happening. Uh, what are your thoughts? I would say yes, like for sure. It, for me, it's it's that sense of um, off centeredness or sort of even what I what I was saying before, like um, I think sometimes like let's say you're on the same kind of like trail you always walk on or something like that same city street and you sort of stop noticing what's around you because you're so used to it and I think the same thing can happen sometimes with the ways that we use language and so I think that um, introducing that strangeness kind of brings back that ability to notice again and to like look again more closely um, which again I think um, is kind of a good starting point for um, approaching like such an overwhelming and such a huge um, heavy topic as others have said. Um, yeah, and I think as well, um, yeah, for me, like it is a very weird destabilizing time to be living through where like it often feels like multiple layers of reality are happening at the same time or like 
we're trying to sort of, you know, go about our day to day lives and these calamities are happening sometimes really close, sometimes farther afield. But like, I don't know, there's something about that sense of like these layers of experiences and and feeling disconnected, but also very much immersed in everything all at once um, that I think I'm trying to get at with that that strangeness in the language. For sure. There's that feeling of, of, of like multiple, multiple streams of reality happening at all times, multiple layers. It's a very, um, I just refer to it as 2021, like 2021 <laughs> consciousness at this point. Totally. Yeah. Um, Ross, do you have any thoughts on strangeness? Well, I, you know, I, the way I kind of think of sort of building off what Claire was saying is, is um, you know, we have this kind of um, consensus reality we live in, especially in urban centers. It's far removed from nature and the real world. And we feel everything's way more controlled than it really is. I mean, the pandemic's illustrated that for us. But there's lots of other things that happen uh, well outside of human control. So I think that strangeness helps um, helps us move into more of a actual real world. It's more complex. I think also poetry uh, access the unconscious. Um, so, you know, the strangeness is sort of an expression of that uh, on the part of the writer, getting at those sort of non-logical dreamlike uh, impulses we have. And I think that's important in environmental poetry because of that, um, you know, the separation between the natural world, which we're really part of, and this artificial uh, human-made world we've made up. Right, and it and it sort of brings to mind like what is truly strange? Like, is is the real world the strange one, or is it the the world that we've constructed that we've that we refer to as the real one? And that's why 2020 was so crazy because it was like all the stuff we thought was like a lot of stuff came tumbling down, you know. Um, Kim, did you have any other thoughts on strangeness, or did you say did you say what you wanted to say there? I'll just say one thing. I recently wrote a poem about the Ferry Creek situation of clear-cut logging in Ferry Creek on Vancouver Island and the huge blockade, largest act ever of Canadian civil disobedience, over 1,100 arrests. And so it was a simple, straightforward poem. And when I was done with it, I was not very happy. It was too on the nose, too obvious in every way. And I thought, I just felt to myself, this isn't good poetry and people aren't really going to rise to it. So for whatever reason, I transposed it to another planet. And I thought what I got was very, very interesting, was much more interesting. And yet everybody can still bring to it what's going on here, whether they see Fairy Creek or some other ecological disaster on this planet. But that might be part of the role for strangeness. If we transpose the normal to strange, it almost elevates it to a, a higher and more powerful level. Wow, and yeah, and what a way to get through people's uh, people's mental blocks around wanting to look at a very specific situation. Wow, that's an, that's a very fascinating technique, Kim. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think that sort of leads into my next question as well, uh, which is to where do you situate yourself in a history of poets writing about nature? Um, and what does it mean to write poetry about nature at this particular point in history, this particular point in space and time? Um, I think to some extent we're, and you've heard people say we're post nature now, like the natural world has been totally pretty well touched everywhere by humans in a not very good way. Uh, so I think the current eco poetry reflects that. It's really, it's not sometimes, you know, we don't have the, the romantic exaltation of nature on its own anymore. It's usually quite often humans interacting in nature or nature attempting to uh, overcome humanity and, uh, you know, in the third landscape. Like, um, so I, I think it's the poetry, at least the way I think of it, is complex, uh, in same as the human, human's relationship to name is also complex. Thanks, Ross. 
Claire, do you have thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Ross's comments on this. Um, and I definitely would situate myself among that sort of, yeah, shifting away from like, I guess like even just ever trying to see a separation between like nature, even, even from an urban perspective, like a separation from like nature and humanity or um, urban and nature or something like that, like, fi like finding that place where those things blend or the borders bleed into each other um, or there are no borders. Um, and other poets that, you know, I really admire that are doing similar things like um, Ariel Gordon comes to mind, um, Tannis McDonald, like urban nature poets, I think um, I really, yeah, I really admire the work that that's going on right now in that space. Um, but also I think with this collection, I was definitely in conversation with um, not necessarily just poets, but also other uh, writers, um, like mostly women writers from the past who had also written about nature and their experiences in it. Um, and yeah, looking for ways to maybe just trouble that their um, accounts or, or see them from a modern perspective or a, a contemporary, I guess I should say, perspective. Um, and take a little bit of a critical lens to some of um, what was going on while also um, also honoring that the history there too. Um, so yeah, that's that's where I would sort of situate myself, I guess. Thank you, Claire. And, and I think one thing I'm particularly interested in and think that this may be partly the role for 21st century poets and particularly around nature and environment is to animate others, animate entire communities and entire groups of people to use poetry to do something positive for the environment. I'm thinking of things like uh, Susan McCaslin's project where the Hanshan Forest, where she solicited poems from everyone everywhere to hang in. Each poem was then hung in a forest that was uh, under threat of being logged. And of course, media generation, me media attention was generated and the forest was saved. I mean, actually by a collective act of poetry, essentially. And I think there are many such examples of this and uh, of where, and perhaps this is the poet's role today, not only that we write our own poems for our own books and do our own book launches, but that we actually, in our role as poets, use our voice and our vision to inspire and animate entire communities. Wow, that's really inspiring. Thank you, Kim. You all are making me very excited to be a poet. I feel like this is, <laughs> this is, this is excellent. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about your 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 writing processes and what I want to know specifically is if nature plays a particular role in the process of, of making your work do you write outside do you have a um, do you have a particular place that you like to write does and does nature affect your writing directly in that way so for me uh, I would yes. say oh sorry go ahead Kim well, uh, yes, uh, I would just say almost all of my best poems start outside. They don't necessarily get finished inside because I'm very chained to a keyboard and I don't have a keyboard outside. And uh, the flow of words at a certain point is just impeded if I don't get onto a keyboard. But the ideas and the first lines almost always come when I'm out in nature or even just out in my garden or even just out walking in downtown Nanaimo through streets, alleys, homeless camps. I actually do do that, inhabit that space quite a lot because I think that's nature as well. I mean, it's very hard to carve off nature from urban landscapes, but that's where the good ideas and the good opening use of language comes from is outside and in contact with the world. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, I was going to say um, along similar lines, I think a lot of my um, ideas or images definitely start outdoors as well. Um, whether it's, you know, a wilderness trip or or um, like Kim was saying, like just a, a walk in the city or something like that. But for sure, um, a lot of those experiences inform the starts of poems. But I would also say and kind of like tying into what we've been talking about, um, 
I often find like finding out interesting strange facts about nature like randomly on the internet is often like a seed of of um, a piece for me and it'll lead to other places but I think I don't know that's another just uh, interesting kind of like overlap in borders and and like layers of reality um, that I find I work with a lot is like experiencing nature in this mediated way through the internet um, also informs my work a lot of the time. Thank you, Claire. I, um, I think of something Claire said earlier about um, paying attention, I think, you know. Um, so I, I, nature, being out in nature, you pay attention to it. And I think also following up when you get back inside images that stuck with you, but also as uh, Claire just mentioned, doing research on the Internet uh, about things you saw or things you have questions about. So the curiosity about the world, getting out in the world and then coming back in and having curiosity about what you just experienced. Uh, for me, that really drives a lot of the work as well. Thank you so much. I have a, a couple more questions, but I just wanted to let uh, the audience know that we're going to do audience questions at the end. So if you have questions for our poets, um, please add them to the to the chat box uh, and we'll we'll do that probably at 755. Um, I would like to know just as a follow up to that question. Um, did your relationship with nature change as a result of, of writing this collection or, or how did your relationship with nature change from the beginning to the end of the process of, of putting this, these books together? Yeah, I think uh, writing. Would, oh, go ahead. You go ahead. Oh, you take it, Claire. All right. Um, yeah, for, so for me, um, writing this collection really made me reflect on, interrogate my own role in white settler colonialism um, a lot more than I had. Um, especially, uh, there's a part of the collection that really revisits um, uh, time that I spent at summer camp and you know, that was like such a formative experience for me. I, I really like, it, it shaped so much of who I am and it's so core to like, even just like what, how I think of myself, who, what my identity is, but like writing this, researching for the collection, it really made me think like what was lost or what was the cost of that and um, the role of colonialism in creating this space that I could access that was taken from others. Um, so for me, finding that kind of positionality and um, really reflecting more on that than I ever had um, in a really deep way on this like very personal front, I think really, yeah, it was a big um, shift for me as I as I wrote and reflected. And like, I think it, I think it felt like it um, spread through the rest of my writing and, and continues to and, and to my relationship with wilder spaces now too. Thanks, Claire. Uh, Can I you? think in my case, what I noticed was uh, uh, there was less of a separation between me and nature. I think intellectually I had always, you know, I had for a long time known that that's an artificial separation, but I actually came to feel it in my body that that separation was not real. Um, that nature is not a thing out there. We're all nature. And I, I would say that's how the book affected my relationship with nature. Thank you, Ken. I think, I think um, as I think about that question, um, you know, it, when I saw the final collection and people read it, I had the response to this idea that things are really complicated. You know, when we're all living in a, in a human world designed for the use of fossil fuels. So we all have some complicity, yet we want to change. Um, and uh, I think trying to see that balance um, through the work and also bringing nature, our roles with nature, our impacts on nature into the work. Uh, and I end up feeling in the end, everything was way more complicated than just black and white, I think. Thank you, Ross. 
Did anything surprise you in the writing of of your collection? I'm sure I'm sure lots of things did, but maybe one or two. Um, on, I was surprised that the interest in some of my work poems. Um, you know that first poem I read, first book, the editor moved it to the front. I had it buried in the middle somewhere. And it didn't, uh, because I lived it, I guess, um, it wasn't that unusual to me, but other people, you know, appreciate it. And I, I think there's a number of work poems in there that I didn't realize would interest people. That was the surprising thing to me. Any other thoughts on that surprise surprises, Kim or Claire? Um, I think in my case, uh, I was just surprised. I'd been struggling about where where I'm actually going to find the through line for the book and when it's going to be done and how I'm going to organize it. And then it all became clear to me that this book has actually been done and ready to go for a while. And so it was just more of an internal creative reflection that I had been missing the obvious kind of way to organize this book, the coherence, which was absurdity in the face of disaster. That was really what it all came down to. And uh, I had been groping around for some much more elaborate intellectual, you know, ways to organize a narrative, but, but the book was done long before I realized it. Oh, that resonates so much. And wow, what a metaphorical act to, to, to try and organize a book about like, chaos. Yeah. <laughs> Claire, what surprised you? Yeah, along similar lines, I think um, being able to find the through lines through, like, even though I knew there were themes, um, you know, at play in a lot of the poems, when I got down to that kind of organizational stage of editing and and shifting things around and, and trying to find a structure, like just um, discovering the structure, I think was um, surprising to me and and yeah it was almost like something that was hiding in there in you, when you write poems you often just write them you know one by one and you know maybe one inspires the next but like so, like yeah some that that were written you know a couple years apart even um felt like they belonged side by side or in the same section um whereas others you know definitely were written kind of in the same vein at the same time so so yeah that that structure and that process was was a surprise i think wonderful it's like the collections are sort of becoming themselves over time as separate entities totally um all right so i guess my my uh okay well i'm gonna ask you this first because i really want to know which poem in your collection is your favorite <laughs> Well, uh, for in my book, honestly, my favorite poem is the title poem, Evolution, and I don't think it's anybody else's favorite poem. I think most people don't really know what to do with that poem, but for me, I just love it and take the journey every time I read it. Even privately to myself, I take the journey all over again, and it puts a smile on my face, literally. That's wonderful to hear. <laughs> Uh, for me, I think the poem at a slew in Eugene, and it combines one of my favorite persons in my favorite place, as well as another favorite place, which is Banff. So um, that's my favorite poem. Um, for me, I think it would be the Frontier Diary Suite, um, which is a suite of erasure poems in the book, um, engaging with like uh, homesteaders, women's accounts of, um, yeah, of, of living in, in wilder places. Um, I just felt like, yeah, it was just a really cool process to write those and really rewarding and just like felt like so, it was like a feeling of like, almost like working with a, a different kind of medium, like being like up to your elbows in language in a way. And so um, I, I like to return to them, but um, also just thinking about the process of writing them. Um, yeah, it makes me happy. That's awesome. Glad to hear it. Um, 
what is next for each of you? And it's okay if, if what's next is just like lying down. People always ask that question. You always expect it to be this big next project, but yeah, just, what's, what's the next thing? Uh, I don't know for sure, but I have for 10 years been working very slowly and in a confused way on a, a project about electrosensitivity. People who are electrosensitive, I myself am mildly electrosensitive, and uh, I don't know if this is going to be a book telling people stories or a book of my poems about this issue, but I am quite fascinated by the notion that we as a civilization are making our planet, our one and only planet, too toxic for us to even uh, continue inhabiting. And that actually is, the de there's a scientific term for that, which is catabolic collapse. And uh, so the concept of electrosensitivity and the people who are electrosensitive, who may, you know, essentially be the canaries in the coal mine, uh, it's it fascinates me. And I'm trying to do something with it creatively. Uh, for me, I am uh, just slowly writing new poems, but um, I wouldn't say it's a it's a next project yet. It's sort of those early manuscript poems like ex exploration and uh, play. I've been playing around with a couple um, YA manuscripts as well. And uh, honestly, what is actually next is uh, finish knitting a sweater. Uh, first time yeah. knitting a sweater. <laughs> Perfect time of year for it. Uh, I'm collaborating on a translation of the, the French surrealist Paul Elward's collection La Vie Immediate from 1932. Um, it's taking, it's a lot of work, so it's going in spits, uh, fits and starts. Um, and I'm also writing a hybrid work of poetry and prose using a journal I kept for a couple months back two years ago uh, for a road trip to the West Coast. And at the same time, uh, my mother died while I was on that trip. So it's kind of a combination of, that, uh, of all that material and incorporates like bound text, uh, lyric poetry and some prose. Uh, has climate change changed nature poetry? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know that it has. I think environmental concerns have been with us for like, you know, since Rachel Carson's writing in the uh, 60s, right? So I, I think, or, and before, right? I, I think there's even more impetus now with, uh, with, you know, this horrendous thing that's happening to us. But I think concern about the environment's been with me my whole life, you know. So I, I think, yes, it's changed it maybe because more and more is happening, but people have been writing about it for a long time. Uh, last week during the climate fiction conversation, the writers talked about an impulse to educate, but also that the story needs to have its own life. Is that something you think about as poets, facts or science, and whether that impulse to educate is uh, part of the process? Yeah, I uh, I think I think I don't know if it's an impulse to educate, but more to sort of like we've been talking about throughout this conversation, like to in invoke or evoke uh, curiosity or um, it, yeah, it's more an emotion or a, a response rather than um, than having it, it's cool if someone learned something from a poem, but I think um, I think that yeah, the opportunity to make someone else curious about, you know, whatever <laughs> strange nature fact I found on the internet or, um, or you know, um, feel the, the, like, I have a few poems in the collection about um, endangered or extinct species and, like, to feel that loss um, and things like that, I think, to me, is more, in at least in my work, is, is more the impulse than uh, educational, I would say. I think on that, I would attempt to be factually correct if I'm putting a fact out there, unless it's obviously made up. Um, so I, I think that's sort of an impulse to educate, I suppose. It's like if people are reading something and they think they're learning from something from it, I'd like to be it to be right. Kim, the question was, um, 
about whether there's sort of like an educational component to uh, environmental poetry. Did you want to speak to that? Um, I probably don't use it to educate in a direct factual way, like a nature field guide, although I am a very avid amateur naturalist myself. Um, but I would say I take a broader view of education in the form of trying to inspire people to be interested, get that information themselves. Um, but I, it's a little hard with my fabulous approach to uh, also get things that are Wikipedia accurate. Thank you so much to these wonderful poets. It was, this was a, a fantastic discussion and I really appreciate your thoughts. Um, like I said, you've you've made me feel really, really excited about about poetry and being a poet and, and reading poetry and, and excited about the role of a poet uh, in this in this new world that we're facing. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, thank you so much to HPL and to Nancy and and uh, I hope that everyone in the audience will go and pick up these wonderful books. Wonderful. Thanks. Many thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. It's a thanks. pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye.